Steve Sippel. Hut, hut, hey! The conversation gets even more uncomfortable, okay? Omaha! <laughs> Steve Sippel on the Connor Happer Show on 1620, The Zone. None other than Steve Sipple on the line joining us for the Connor Happer Show today on 1620 The Zone. Austin Jacobson in once again for Hap. Steve, how's everything going out in Lincoln? Wrapping up all those coaches talking points and everything else happening with practice today. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you like? <laughs> Austin. Um, well, there was a lot. G- give me a specific. Ask me a specific all right. question. Perfect. Uh, yellow hats and Garrett McGuire. What what was your take on that? Are you going to be rocking a yellow hat all season long? I wondered about that, Austin. Um, I, I think there's probably some kind of purpose to that, right? Like, so his guys can see him um, on the sideline or wherever he is. <laughs> I I like yellow. I do. I was just telling somebody the other day that, like, a, a yellow Ram truck with black striping is pretty i've always felt was pretty cool or it doesn't have to be a ram just a any kind of pickup i always thought that yellow color was kind of cool so i guess it would apply to caps too i i can't disagree you're a big fan of bumblebee the transformer then that's a (laughs) your Uh, go-to i don't know i don't even know who bumblebee the transformer is but (laughs) that that whole bumblebee uh car like if it's a challenger dodge challenger yellow and black i like it i mean i've always liked that color configuration all right well we love that we also uh i I was curious your thought when it came to dylan rayola we've heard a lot about him Mm -hmm. of course Uh, i don't know if you've heard he's the freshman quarterback but what's he doing differently than other freshmen starting quarterbacks we've seen over the last few decades has he handled this role and responsibility better than taylor or adrian martinez did in, in their first year well i don't know about that i mean I mean, I would just say, Austin, so far, so good, you know? Is he handling it any better? I don't think we'll know that until, you know, until the games start. Um, Adrian handled things really well. Who else did you mention? Taylor. Taylor Martinez, too. You can throw him in there. Yeah, Taylor handled, Taylor handled it well. They ha- Those guys handled uh, August well, and they, you know, they, they were ready to go. Um, so I don't know that Dylan is necessarily doing anything much better that's discernible, at least to someone who's not there every day, which I'm not, I'm not in the building every day. No, you know, I'm not part of the team. I, I, I would tell you this about Dylan. I, I never worry about it. I never really worried about Adrian either though. Um, for similar reasons. In fact, there's a, it's a kind of a similar discussion. They're both very mature. They're both guys you can count on. They're both smart football players. Although I give Dylan an edge in that. I hope Adrian's not listening. I, I mean, Dylan's really advanced. Taylor was advanced, too. But Dylan kind of takes that part to another level. And I'm talking about what he sees at the line of scrimmage, his ability to check in and out of things. is really high level for someone that, that, that age. Um, I just... I guess the best way to put it is I never worry about it. That's the, he's about the least of my concerns on that team. And that's saying a lot about a freshman, but he's a different kind of freshman. Yeah. A lot of other concerns that came up throughout the week, obviously Teddy Prohaska yeah. out for the year at offensive tackle Turner Corcoran still in with that first team role, but a, a younger lineup they went with as reported through the media session earlier today, what was your take on how the offensive line depth is being built, especially with some of the younger players that might need to step up? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. They got it. It's going to be an interesting August now. Okay. I, I mean, you have to take into account that that line goes against a very good defensive line. Like, you know, it may be one of the nation's best. So everything has to be judged in that context but if you take i'll do it this way okay and i'm i'm fixing to write a sunday column about this so i have to start getting my thoughts together if you take prohaska out which he's out he's out for good um corcoran didn't practice today okay he's out and then latovsky's out 
you know, n- neither Latovsky nor Corcoran are out for good, obviously. They'll be back. But when you take Prohaska, Corcoran, and Latovsky out, it's trouble. It's just trouble. But it's not, I don't know how they're, they, I don't, you don't want that to be the case against Colorado. I mean, you might be able to get by UTEP. I mean, that's got to, it'd make the UTEP game interesting. I'll tell you that. That's my opinion. If those three are all, all not available, um, or those, we'll say Latovsky and Corcoran are not available. They, I hope they're available. Um, they, got, they have pretty good depth, but not great. I mean, I, the whole media narrative that the O line and the D line have great depth is incredibly false. I mean, the D line does, the O line doesn't. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, they, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something, Austin. There's a challenge over there right now. I mean, that scrimmage tomorrow, which nobody's going to see, is going to be really interesting. I'm glad you brought up the Colorado matchup as well. It, it felt like at, at this time last year, Matt Rule and some of the other pundits and everywhere and circling around Nebraska football was talking about Colorado and almost whispers, right? It, it was like offhand comments that people had to link back to how Rule was talking about Coach Prime or the Colorado program. Do you feel like there's a different approach to this year's matchup than last year? Oh, Trying to think back, I don't know how much different. You know what? What I how I'd answer that question? I don't think anybody's thinking about it right now over here. So I don't know what their approach is. I think they they're not. They got issues of their own to deal with. Um, now, I mean, I don't think. Um, I don't think they're thinking too much about Colorado right now. I think if I were the coach, I would I would be very intent on making sure that's the message that we got to beat UTEP. All right. UTEP's UTEP's going to be, I mean, Nebraska's not in a, a position to overlook anybody. So I doubt they're think. I hope they're not thinking much about Colorado right now. Looking at what we uh, heard today from some of those coaches as well, Steve, uh, the running backs coach, E.J. Barthel, out there talked a little bit about those top three running backs, added Dante Dowdell in there with the fourth. Is there one back that is standing out amongst those four, or is it truthfully a running back by committee, and that's the expectation at least through the first few weeks? Looks like a, you know, it, it looks like a committee, but it, but I think the story of camp in that room, at least, is Ramir Johnson. I mean, Ramir Johnson was with the ones right out of the gate today. Okay, it wasn't Emmett Johnson; it was Ramir Johnson. Um, Ramir Johnson is now, I thought maybe the key quote of the day from Barthel was that Ramir looks better than he's ever looked since, since EJ has been here. Now it's only been two years, but he does look really good. Ramir looked good today. I mean, he's, he's a man. That's the best way to put it. He's a, you know, he's a grown up now and this is a grown up league. This is a league of grown ups. Um, if you're not, then you about, then if you're not a veteran player, you must be really good if you're playing as a young guy. Um, this is a league that I think that, that really you need veteran players like Ramirez Johnson, and I think Emmett Johnson's good too. Um, I I give Ramirez a little bit of an edge because of his speed and his big playability, um, but Emmett's tough. I think those two guys are the leaders. That's what I wrote today. I, and I would probably give Ramirez a slight edge right now. Speaking with Steve Sipple today after some Husker practice commentary and checking in on all what's happening with the Big Red. Kind of wanted to ask you some big picture stuff and got to thinking about Troy Dannon and his first year in evaluation. What a difference it is comparative to the first year under Trev Alberts. How different is Dannon's evaluation of all athletics going maybe compared to that first year where Trev had a lot of decisions to make in that very first stint, especially with those coaches. Now, I don't have a really good handle on that. I don't. I, I did like, there's something I really loved about Trev and I can't, and I don't, and I haven't had any one-on-one time with Dan. And so I haven't, I hadn't, I haven't really been able to, to get a handle on this part, but what I loved about, 
and this sounds kind of funny, but it, it was just that went, that W's and L's mattered, and and that he had to send that message through the athletic department. It wasn't enough of a message under I course. It got better under Moose, but then it got then it was then it went to another level with Trev. Trev, I think, because he was a you know a very competitive athlete, as was Moose, by the way. But um, he just ramped it up in that way, and I haven't heard Dan and talk about that element as much. I think Trev felt coming in that he had to emphasize it. It sounds funny, right? It should always matter, but. But I've, you know, there's there's people that emphasize that bottom line more than others, just like any any other any other element that a manager faces. Some managers some managers emphasize some elements more than others. So I don't know. I don't have a great feel for Dan. I'm not even sure. I I, I don't. I need to right now. It's so early. I'm not signing off on ads like I used to. Like. Oh yeah, I think he's great. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I I think if you're a Nebraska fan, you might you, you're probably like that. I mean, you just don't nod your head and say, "Oh, he's great." I don't know if he's great. We'll see if he's great. You know, what usually defines a AD is the football coach he hires, and if all goes well here, Dan won't even have to do that. Um, if all goes well with Fred, he won't have to even do that. And that's kind of how you judge those guys anyway. Going back to football, is there any discussion, whether it's with the athletic department, the football program itself, or just what everyone's outside opinion is, when it comes to the end of season results, when you get down to mm -hmm. if the Huskers make a bowl game, what their win total may look like, what result by the end of 2024 or even the beginning of 2025 would Nebraska feel that they're ahead of schedule? Oh, that's a great question. I think ahead of schedules, eight and four, nine and three, or, you know, anything more than eight. Um, I think so. Now, some people might say, no, this is an eight win team. They wouldn't be ahead of schedule. And I'd listen to that. It, and then you get into the whole, what's the season look like conversation. It's sometimes it's hard just to say a record and say, this is what it needs to be. What's that? What did, what did it look like? You know, did they lose their final four? You know, um, or did they win their final five? I don't know. It, you just never know what, it, what it, but I think I do believe if they would go nine and three in the regular season, you would say that's ahead of schedule. And boy, that would be nice. That would be nice. Again, talking with Steve Sipple today on 1620 The Zone, Connor Happer Show. And just looking again at that big picture, obviously August 9th, we've got a lot of time to talk about everything coming up with the season. I was curious your thoughts just on the, the pressure maybe to get guys further developed to that next level. We, we were joking about it earlier on the show. Another Christian McCaffrey comment came up today with EJ Barthel, but with a senior-led team, a lot of returning NFL potential, maybe draftable players from this past draft coming back to play for the Huskers, does it feel critical to have some guys drafted into 2025 to prove the development of this program? Oh, I, yeah. I mean, yes and no. I don't look at it quite like that. I, I, but I do think it's important to have multiple guys get drafted. I mean... To have you know five, five or more, it doesn't have to be five, but you know multiple guys of that caliber. We've seen at Nebraska now what happens when you don't have NFL players. We've gone through drafts with with nobody getting drafted, and that in, that embarrassment. It's embarrassing, but it's also to me it's more about you can't you can't win at a high level if you don't have multiple guys that are draftable and preferably you have a, a first rounder or two. I, I, I always appreciate that question because it's critical. And it is so critical. I can't even tell you. I mean, it's how do you win in the big 10? If you don't have NFL players, if you don't have several, you know, multiple, I'll say multiple NFL caliber players, hell Nebraska had them in 
2000. Under Frost, they had them. Still didn't really, didn't, you know, win at the level they needed to. And they didn't have enough of them. And, and I'm not talking about guys that just squeak in the draft. I'm talking about guys you say, oh, yeah, that's a first rounder. A couple of those guys, you know, Randy Gregory, Malik Collins wasn't a first rounder. Randy would have been had he not gotten in trouble. But those guys that are so identifiable, that it doesn't require a, a scout to tell you, you know, he's a first rounder. You just know it matters a lot to have those guys, type of guys. Those guys get you over the hump. Last question for you. Uh, newest news coming out, a commitment flip with Isaiah Mosey out of Missouri, changing from Oregon to Nebraska. What was your take on this? What, what did you think as Nebraska gets another playmaker? Well, he's the high, he'll be the, highly, the most highly rated player in the class right now, as of today. Okay, So that mean, it's meaningful in that regard, right? Um, the most highly rated player in the class. Um, I like, he's interesting. He's a, if you watch his film, he's an interesting player because he's, he's a receiver that really runs well after the catch because he's also a running back. I mean, you could play him at running back, is what I'm telling you. He'd be smallish, but if you watch his film, there's clips of him at running back. And he's a good running back. So naturally, he runs really well after the catch. He's not, you know, he's not like Nayor or Bang. He's not a big, tall kid on the outside. He's a smaller guy. Um, I don't know what they list him as. I might guess is 5'10", 180, something like that. But I like him. I mean, he's, he's a, he's, he's a, I, I, I just, you know, he can run with it. And that's, obviously can catch it. But I like that, I like that element of run after the catch. And he's really good at that. All right, Steve. Appreciate your time as always. Enjoy your weekend and looking forward to that Sunday column coming out. All right. God bless you. Thanks, thanks for the questions and have a good show.